Hello and welcome to today's Ecosiv Dialogue on Global System Change. My name is Andrew Schwartz. I am co-founder and executive vice president of the Institute for Ecological Civilization, director of the Center for Process Studies and assistant professor at Claremont School of Theology at Willamette University. Um, it's my privilege to be the moderator today uh, with three amazing panelists who are really um, innovators in reimagining ecological civilization uh, for the future of the well being of the planet. So, um, this, uh, the Institute for Ecological Civilization, we convene leaders, experts from around the world um, in order to design solutions that address the root causes of our complex social and environmental challenges. Um, and that is sort of why we're here, right? This, the spirit of this dialogue um, series is to explore alternative paradigms uh, toward global systems change in a variety of sectors. Um, so today, really thinking about um, transforming our systems of education in order to help us build a more sustainable and equitable world. It's uh, my privilege uh, to have us today joining us all the way from Seoul, South Korea, is Hyun Jo. He is a superintendent of the Seoul Metropolitan Office of Education, which oversees roughly a million students in Korea. Um, so a lot of, of young educators uh, that he's influencing there. He is um, an educator and an activist, uh, trained as a sociologist. Superintendent Joe is, uh, it was a visiting professor at Southern California University, I think, as well as a professor of sociology <laughs> at Anglican University in Korea. Um, later became vice president of the Institute for Democratic yeah. uh, Social Policy and Secretary General of People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy before being named director of the Korean Society of Industrial Science and Technology. <laughs> so, uh, very illustrious career um, and still on the rise. He's uh, recently, 2018, won the Educational Achievement Award for the prestigious Korea Contributions Award and also in 2019 won the Praise Education uh, Leader Award. So Superintendent Cho, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you for joining. Uh, joining us, uh, from Arizona in the United States of America is Marcus Ford. Uh, so Marcus is co-founder of Flagstaff College, a school whose mission is to prepare students to be leaders in creating a sustainable, just, and beautiful ecological civilization. Aww. He was one of the first professors in the United States to teach courses in sustainability and to develop an environmental humanities program. And uh, since early in his teaching career, Marcus has held that the most important thing that we can learn is how to live sustainably and justly within the bounds of the natural world. Um, incredibly important vision. Uh, he's the author of the groundbreaking book, Beyond the Modern University, uh, which we'll be reading in my class in a couple of weeks. And he's co-editor of the 2017 book, Educating for an Ecological Civilization. So Marcus, thank you so much. Glad to have you with us. Last and certainly, but not least, joining us now from Costa Rica, is Miriam Valela. Miriam is executive director of the Earth Charter International and the Earth Charter Center on Education for Sustainable Development. Uh, she has been very active in the United Nations, uh, having worked for the United Nations Conference on Environmental uh, Environment and Development, mm -hmm. participating in multiple UN conferences on sustainable development over the years. Mm -hmm. And in 2004, I think, Miriam joined the faculty at University for Peace an intergovernmental organization established by the UN, uh, where she teaches in the areas of sustainable development, environmental governance, and education for sustainable development, um, all inspired largely by the Earth Charter. Uh, she is the author of multiple publications, including Teaching a Sustainable Lifestyle with the Earth Charter and Good Practices with the Earth Charter in Education. So very applicable uh, for what we're talking about today. Miriam, thanks for joining. Um, your second education webinar for the day, as the Earth Charter had one earlier uh, this morning, another wonderful webinar. Um, education, was it education uh, like the Earth matter? Education as if the Earth mattered. Yes, so look Earth, that up on YouTube. Matter. All right, so our format today is really it's supposed to be dialogical and interactive, despite the fact that I've been talking straight. Um, and so for those of you who are watching at home, you can submit your questions to our panelists using the comments feature um, on Facebook Live um, or the Q&A feature on Zoom for those of you who are using that. 
So I want to dive in with um, sort of a fundamental question, but maybe it's a, also a big one. Um, and that's, what is the purpose of education? What role does education have in changing civilizational paradigms uh, toward a more sustainable and equitable society? So Marcus, I'm gonna have, have you jump in and tackle that one. Uh, what's in your mind, what's the purpose of education? What role does it have for transitioning paradigms? <laughs> No, I, I, I think there are two questions there. What is the purpose of education? And the second one is what role can it play in transitioning? And I, I would just briefly say that the role of education is to, in a way, help us be more human and, and to uh, live richer lives and um, to build community. I mean, that, that's the ideal role of an education. Um, the role that it can play in moving society in another direction, that's a much tougher question because um, quite often universities are not known uh, for their activism. Um, minor exceptions here and there, but for the most part, they reflect the wider society. Um, and so it, it's very challenging for, um, I mean, the kind of thing I'm working on is um, breaking up large universities, establishing lots and lots of small colleges and kind of modeling the kind of behavior, attitude, uh, philosophy that a sustainable society needs. It's harder to do in a large institution, not, maybe not impossible, but harder, I think. Anybody else want to add to that? What do you see as the, the purpose of education? And then the second, I think a related question, the role that education could and should play in transitioning us to a more sustainable and equitable world. Let me follow the Marcus. <clears throat> uh, in my view, uh, education is a learning process that affects human perception and human behavior. It affects how we perceive the world and how we change the world in the light of that perception. Through education, each student becomes a social being with the, with the specific awareness and the specific behavior. So today's topic in my understanding is the relation between education and the transformative role of education for ecological civilization. Uh, if you excuse me, I want to introduce uh, our education reform movement change. Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, in Korean history, 1987, the year 1987 is the turning point. Hmm. Before 1987, is the authoritarian period, dictatorial period. And after 1987 is the democratization period, democracy pursuing period. So in Korean, the Korean education reform movement is changing from opposition against authoritarian regime and authoritarian education to regime and education system based on democracy principle. And uh, after 1987, we have achieved democracy and beginning to change education, former authoritarian education to democracy-based education. 
authoritarian education is not just authoritarian education. It is the it is based on the Cold War anti-communism, right wing political conservatism, and that authoritarian regime uh, is is oriented to pursue modernization. That modernization is a process in our context to imitate, uh, it introduce the Western industrial modern regime. Based on, in my understanding, industrialism, statism, nationalism, productivism, grossism, and marketism. So in the name of democracy, we try to change this kind of education to new way. And here, uh, feminism comes in, civilization, ecological civilization perspective comes in, pro-labor comes in. We understand that deepening democracy, expanding democracy in the way to introduce new alternative ideas, orientation, perspective, including feminism and the pro-labor idea. And recently in this climate crisis, we are trying to relate deepening democracy education, expanding democracy education related to alternative transformative education for new ecological civilization. We call, in Korean context, we call this kind of uh, education reform movement based on democracy as a innovative education movement, innovative school creating movement. That okay. is As an introductory, I want to. <laughs> Thank you so you. much for that introduction of what you're already achieving and trailblazing uh, in the Korean context. I think that that actually helps answer the question about the role of education uh, by also speaking to the sort of underlying values in our systems of education. Um, so as, as Superintendent Cho rightly said, right, education plays a significant role in shaping how we understand our world and our relationship to it. Um, and that means that education imparts a worldview, right? That then becomes the bedrock of our modern civilization. Um, you know, and that the social and economic organization of that modern civilization has been very damaging uh, to people and the planet. So then I think it raises the question of the kinds of values and worldviews and the priorities that dominate the sort of current model of education, the current systems of education, um, and then sort of opening the door for what new um, alternative values, worldviews, and priorities would be necessary for a new reimagined education. Miriam, do you have a thought on that? Yes, uh, I first would like to mention when you asked the question about what's the purpose of education, uh, I think from a, a a Latin American point of view, I can say that uh, parents want their kids to go to school because they are very concerned that uh, they want their children to have a better opportunities uh, in the future. So I think uh, the reason why uh, we uh, people go to a university or parents are really concerned to get their kids to go through secondary education and, and to go to possibly the best universities if, if they can, is, is very focused on, uh, on the fact that education opened the doors for the individual, you know, in terms of self-realization. Um, so 
I think it's only one side of the coin of the purpose of education. Uh, and it's uh, unfortunately, we are limited to looking at the purpose of education as, as, uh, as something that will ena enable people to, to reach to, to better opportunities in the future. And therefore, there is a lens of, that is looking at education from a very utilitarian angle. However, I think we need to, to look at the other side of the coin, which is um, we should look at, at the main purpose of education is to get uh, individuals or people who can better serve the society. So really to, to, to remind us that the more educated we are, the, the more responsible we are to contribute with the betterment of our society and the planet. So um, actually there Shara does articulate a principle that says, principle to be that is, uh, that articulates the notion that the more knowledge we have, the more power we have, it comes together a, an increased responsibility to contribute with a common good. And therefore I, it comes to my mind that, oh, it would be nice if we go to, uh, to university as uh, to become a doctor or lawyer or engineer with the thinking, I'm getting this, this uh, training, not only for myself and my family, but I, above all, I'm getting this training because I have an increased responsibility uh, with the well-being of, of our society. So I think we need to look at the two sides of, of the coin of the purpose of education and, and promote the one that it's kind of invisible, at least in terms of from the lenses of the, the, the learner and from the lenses of the parents. Yeah. You want to add something to that, Marcus? Yeah, it's so helpful. Um, you know, when I, when I think about um, higher education, I think about it mainly in terms of the United States. And, and so it's so helpful to get these perspectives from, you know, the rest of the world. Um, but, um, you know, to my mind, the, the overriding values in the United States uh, for universities uh, is very closely tied up with money and power and winning uh, competition, all those things are dominant in the university. And um, if we could somehow transform that so that cooperation and service and responsibility were not just an equal part, but were the dominant part of, of the equation, that, that, that is, would move us in the right direction. And that's what's been I, I think if you go back far enough in the United States, those were values that uh, colleges and universities espoused. But I, I, for the last 50 years, 60 years, um, it's mainly been about individual success and achievement and power. And so it's highly individualized and it's highly focused on financial gain money. Yeah, and that, of course, I mean, it, well, I think it's very uh, true. Yeah. Can I add something? Exactly. I was going to ask you to. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Uh, what you are, what you are saying is very similar to what I'm saying in Korean in different languages. I'm talking like this two hours. Uh, we have to change it from the previous education or number one education to change the new education. I'm using only one education. That is the, the basic central value of Korean innovative school and movement. Uh, Korean society is very competitive or competition respective society. You know, the, the so-called neoliberalism is an extreme form of economic ideology to promote you know, competition among humans. So, uh, 
e, in an economy dominated by uh, very more competitiveness, industrialism, or as I said, you know, growthism, uh, education and career has been a competition to outdo others. So I'm saying uh, education is not a tool or road for winning competition, but it's a tool and the road for self-development. So education which has to transcend competition helps our all students to develop to their full potential and equally respect all students of different nationality, different ethnicity or gender, whether they have excellent grades or not, whether they have outstanding ability or not. I'm calling in Korean practice, this is only one education in which each student is respected, respectively. And we have to develop, helped by artificial intelligence or other new technology. We have to make, you know, only one education pedagogy, only one education classroom. I'm talking in this way in our context. That's interesting. Quite so, similar. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. Does that is that pushing back against the sort of model of like siloed disciplines, which I think many theorists have said is a is a major impediment to solving complex real life problems. Um, when you talk about sort of one classroom, one education, um, is that does that mean sort of working across disciplinary boundaries mm -hmm. in a way that reflects the sort of integral nature of the real world? Is that what you're suggesting? I, I'm curious if that question makes sense. Because I know that's what Marcus is yeah. trying to do in his program at Flagstaff College. Oh, okay, Marcus. Mar Marcus, yeah, would you like to say a little bit about uh, disciplinization and the challenges to sort of solution-oriented education? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, disciplines have been very successful, obviously, um, but I, I think that the, the dark side of discipline is that they fragment things and, um, and uh, lead us off into very tragic conclusions. And so, you know, um, I was thinking, when you were speaking about this one classroom, um, Whitehead said that there's only one subject of education and it's life. Uh, you know, and that, that very big notion that um, we have to understand life, ourselves and the world around us and other people. And disciplines can play a helpful role in that um, uh, regard, but they can also be very, very damaging when they, um, I mean, he talks about the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, but we, we, we begin to think that economics is something different than sociology or history or, you know, we, we break things up and we break them up in such a way that you can never put them back together again. And so um, that, that seems to be a challenge to how to get beyond that. And, and I, I think it's possible to lift up certain topics while reminding students that these topics are related to all these other topics. Uh, but that's not common in the university as it currently exists. May, may I add something to your question on what values are dominating our education systems? And um, I think I would like to, to refer to a couple. One is nationalism versus planetary ethics. Um, 
I think from childhood to, to adulthood, when we are involved in the formal education system, and by the way, we could be talking about education from an angle of formal and non-formal uh, uh, settings, but I think most of us are, are addressing here mostly the, the formal schooling. But I think one is nationalism, um, which is okay, but um, in the current world that we are living, that we, that we need to expand our consciousness with regards to the, our interdependence um, with the fact that for a number of things in terms of climate change, uh, mm. ecological disaster and et cetera, that there are no borders, there are no political borders or geographic borders. If, you, if, if, we, if we don't have fish anymore in the ocean to, or to feed people, for instance, um, it, it, uh, uh, people are going to, to suffer the consequences of that uh, across borders. Uh, if we have uh, air pollution, water pollution, these are things that do not know any border, any frontier. And therefore, I think as much as we learn uh, so much about nationalism and it's so ingrained in our worldviews, uh, we should also, and as much, or maybe why not even more, uh, uh, have experience and learn more about our, our planetary citizenship, our role as planetary citizens um, and the, our responsibility that are, that are, are beyond uh, the political borders of where we come from and even of the culture. So I'm, I'm trying to, to articulate here that I think our education experience and learning and, and schooling need to embed uh, uh, the, or, or needs to cultivate uh, in our minds that kind of uh, um, uh, attachment, <laughs> not only with the nation and the culture where we come from, but also a sort of attachment and responsibility with the planet. So it has to do with a planetary, how can our education system not only concentrate on, on our attachment to the nation where we come from, but also cultivate um, a planetary ethic, uh, a planetary, a deep sense of, uh, uh, we are part of a one earth community. We are part of a one earth family. Uh, we are part of a, of, a, of a planet with shared resources. So I think yeah. this is one of the biggest challenges um, in the current education system because it's so focused on nationalism and not as much in, sh in helping us to expand our view uh, and, and our senses that we also belong to this planet. And therefore, there are uh, rights and above all duties and responsibilities uh, as planetary citizens. And actually we have a, a follow-up question from the audience uh, about that, Miriam, because it seems like um, there's sort of two ways things can go, right? So you can sort of universalize your perspective and understand your sort of shared humanity, you're sharing a planet, sort of a global perspective. But then there's also the, the really localizing contextualization of education, the importance of your own place, your own context. Um, so of course, you know, Marcus is doing a, this micro colleges movement. It's, you know, it's a small community, it's, it's, it's very grounded. And then there's other schools that are doing global programs that are fully online. Um, how do you find the balance between um, the sort of global perspective and this sort of local contextualization? I think it's both. Um, mm -hmm. We have to move away from these uh, uh, mindsets that we are A or B. We can be A and B at the same time. We can nourish uh, our sense of belonging to our culture, right? To our language, to our to the music, to the food, to the very particularities of where we come from, and celebrate that culture diversity and our sense of identity of where we come from. But we also have an identity as part of being part of a 
human uh, identity, no, actually, um, Edgar Morin, a uh, very famous French philosopher, uh, articulates and emphasizes that over and over again, the importance to, to emphasize our human identity at the same time as our uh, uh, cultural identity of where we come from. I like to, to look at it as uh, we are all humans and therefore we enjoy food and we enjoy music and dance. And that's a commonality as humans, right? However, uh, maybe in Latin America, you would like certain kinds of, of food and music. And in, in Asia or Africa, you would like another kind of rhythm for your dance. But we all enjoy dance. Um, we all enjoy music as being part of this human community, right? Art is something that is so important for, for humanity. Even though we could have different tones and different rhythms for our, our music, dance, or even the food. So, Again, uh, just to, to close on this, I think we can uh, come to a point in which we celebrate our cultural diversity and nourish that, our cultural identity, at the same time as uh, having a sense of strong sense of belonging to a planetary community, an earth community, a human community. And with that, um, cultivate this sense of uh, concern, care, responsibility with the large living world. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to add to uh, Miriam's remark. Uh, sometimes recently, uh, I'm asked this kind of question. What is coronavirus? What we have to learn from coronavirus crisis? Coronavirus pandemic is a disaster in which a virus which has lost its natural habitat destroys natural and human ecosystems by using us humans as its new host. Miriam emphasized the interconnectedness. I want to emphasize that as well. Coronavirus teaches us that all things, all humans, humans and animals are interrelated. Everything is connected, interconnected. It clearly shows that the lives and deaths of humans and animals are interconnected. A single person infected with the virus can transmit the virus to hundreds of others living together. And this, in this coronavirus, through social distancing, we are barely managing to survive. This crisis clearly demonstrates that a person's health, one person's health and safety is inseparable from the health and the safety of others, other community. So I think that this is the basic start point for new ecological civilization idea. So I'm emphasizing this kind of thing to our teachers. Oh, that's fantastic. And in relation to Marcus' remark, uh, uh, you know, I call it, it's a kind of the two track approaches are needed. Uh, recently, you know, the untact, you know, learning and tact learning, cool learning and, uh, you know, online learning are needed. And the macro approach and the micro approach can go together. On the micro level, we have to limit our 
consumption. Consumption lifestyle for more and more consumption. But however, such a kind of, you know, uh, consumption limitation is not, is the full condition. And in Miriam's remarks, in relation to re Miriam's remark, you know, it's a cultural approach and the structural approach should go together, of course. Yeah. We have to, you know, draw, uh, it's a kind of wisdom, friendly to new ecological civilization from our, uh, you know, the previous, you know, uh, cultures and tradition. So recently I pay attention to Buddhist, Buddhist, you know, Buddhism, you know, Buddhist conception of causality, you know, not familiar to you, causality, cause and, you know. Buddhism says that all things are interrelated. Even all things in, in current world and the previous world and next world are interrelated. So from that perspective, Naturally, we have to respect others. Respect, we have to respect interrelated others, interrelated even things. So I'm trying to think like this from our, you know, traditional <laughs> culture and uh, religion. Andrew, can yeah. I say something? Um, th that's, this is very interesting and helpful. Um, I, I was going to try to make a distinction between different types of globalism or globalization, where, you know, um, global economics seems like a disaster because it uses so much energy to transport goods and services around the world. And um, as of yet, we haven't found a clean way to ship apples you know, 6,000 miles to be washed and waxed and shipped back to be eaten. Or, I mean, there okay. are sort of silly examples where we bottle water in one part of the world and send it to another back and forth and wine and stuff. So that kind of globalization just seems like is cannot be sustainable, it can't be just, but there's a, another kind of globalization that Marion was talking about, our shared humanity, our shared world, our shared, you know, there's so many other aspects to that other kind of globalization. And, and it seems like the, the corporate world would like to fuse the two together and uh, say, well, if you want one, you gotta have the other or something. And, and I think that we have to find a way to disambiguate the, the two and say, this is the kind of globalization we want. And it is compatible with localization. Here's a kind of globalization that we don't want. And it's completely destructive and incompatible with localization. So I, again, I, I don't have good language for that, but maybe the idea is <laughs> somewhere in there. I think that's super helpful. I, I think that if, uh... The fact that we embrace a planetary view of our responsibility and sense of belonging does not mean that we turn the back to our cultural identity from the local context. Right. We can be both. I can be part of a, a human family and, and shared vision um, about what it means to be human right. and our responsibilities in terms of across cultures uh, with other human beings and with other living beings and our responsibility because we share a common planet. That's the reality, right? And the air we breathe, be it in Brazil, in Costa Rica, in the US is the same air and the water we drink, it, it, this goes across borders, right? And the, the basic human needs, independently of where we come from, northeast, southwest in the world, are the same basic human needs, right? In terms of material needs, 
water, air, food, shelter, but also in terms of, of affection, needs of affection, just family and, and human contact. This is the same, independently of where we come from. So I think there is a kind of misperception that if we embrace this planetary view of what it means to be human and human security, mm. it goes against uh, any uh, cultural or local particularity. It does not need to be. Uh, we don't, don't need to look at that in that way. In fact, I think you, you could argue, I think most of us would want to, yeah, that, to truly understand your, your local identity and culture is to understand it in relation to a global identity, right? Uh, because we're always persons in community. Um, we're never isolated. Of course, of course. You know, uh, Superintendent Cho, you mentioned COVID um, and how that is, is shaping your understanding of, um, you know, our interconnectedness. But... I also realized that, that the pandemic has had a major impact on, on schooling around the world, um, that, that many students are, are doing uh, their coursework from home over the internet. Um, and I think new advancements in technology, um, unprecedented access to information online um, in the information age, how do you see this um, sort of, context, this scenario, changing the future of, of education, the role of teachers specifically. Um, what, what, why do I have a teacher if I can just go on Google and ask Google the answer, right? Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, it's kind of a, I know it's, I'm a horrible moderator. I asked like five questions in one. It was kind of a blend of uh, like, how, what's the effects of COVID on education? Oh, yeah. What's the effects of... Yeah, anyways, <laughs> anything I asked or said in there? But before that, that uh, uh, I want to add something in relation to Marcus and William. In early 2000, uh, is, uh, I have participated while I was at the university as a professor. Uh, I participated in the World Social Forum. So I visited the uh, Porto Alegre and uh, India, Mumbai, Mumbai World Social Forum. You know, you know, the another world is possible. Now still, I'm thinking another ecological world is possible. Yeah. So is sharing such a common, such a common view. But however, we have to start in local context. Uh, in Korean context, experiencing the coronavirus, I think uh, the combination blended learning, including, you know, tech learning, untech learning, in terms of such a blended learning, maybe South Korea is uh, most advanced, I would say, because the Korea nearly 6 million students are all equally, uh, you know, the served in this kind of blended learning, including, you know, device, and internet connection, Wi-Fi, and something like that. But however, the modern, the basic character of the modern capitalism is polarization, economic polarization, deepening economic gap. But in this, the coronavirus crisis, such a kind of economic bipolarization and education bipolarization is deepening. And the, 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 the student with low income family background are much more alienated. As Miriam said, you know, uh, 
the school is closed and the house is open. But in a house, you see the middle class family parents and high income parents support their children fully with their most mobilizing their economic resources. So more supporting. So because of that, you know, education by polarization, education gap is deepening. So of course, but we are trying to uh, supplement this kind of deepening gap. But however, sometimes I'm feeling some kind of, you know, frustration. Yeah. So, uh, well, so uh, we have to the, the 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 public education office and the agency should try to supplement this kind of new crisis, new problems, and in relation to you know, sure, uh, increasingly the role of teacher is changing. Before, you know, the role of teachers, former role of teacher is to it's, uh, deliver more and more knowledge to students, putting more knowledge into students' hands. But however, it's a kind of, you know, coordinator or uh, system developer in which every student are respected with different uh, technological tools or new software program or even AI, you know, new software program, mathematics, AI software program, something like that. So what kind of program, what kind of new technology are fit into these uh, individual students. The teacher should newly think about this, hmm. not just delivering more knowledge to students. So if I hear you correctly, okay, <laughs> it's, it's a shift, a fundamental shift in thinking about education primarily about information to something deeper right, about perhaps wisdom is a term I heard you use multiple times. Um, that seems like a fundamental change uh, of thinking about education. Um, and it does raise the question whether wisdom can be found in Google the same way information can. Um, and I would, I see Miriam saying, no, probably not. Um, no, I think that the, 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 the diff <laughs> certainly not. I think uh, the the difference is that how how was education a hundred years ago was a lot about we go to school because there is where we find information, right? Mm -hmm. And now we have inf access to information uh, in our fingertips, right? In our mobile device, you know, computers, Google, etc. So access to information, actually we are overloaded with information, but the question is what do we do with that information? Does that information have any meaning? And, and, and how, how, to, how to use our sense of judgment also, right? So I think the role coming, I think one of the questions here was the role of the teacher. Um, I think uh, certainly, Conventional education, conventional education is still the majority of the world. We go to a classroom and we see the vertical education, right? You have the teacher that has the knowledge that is supposed to feed in students with information, right? Uh, Paulo Freire used to call it banking education, as if the teacher looks at the students that have an empty head and the role of the teacher is to to fill in the head. Mm. So I, I think that the, this is still the conventional education in most places, right? It's a vertical uh, way of looking at education. However, the huge paradigm shift that is currently going on in education is that it has to do with the 
the role of the teacher is changing, uh, which is I'm not a teacher, that, I mean, doesn't have that role anymore of the one that has information to be shared, but I think it's more as a mediator of content and in the learner, a mediator to ask questions and actually to help students to reflect, to help learners to reflect, help learners to question their own assumptions. Why do I think the way I think? Why do I believe uh, the way I, I believe? You know, where, where my worldview comes from? And, 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 and therefore, I think certainly there is a shift in the way uh, we should look at the role of the teacher as, as, as that facilitator that is there to mediate a process of learning uh, that can only happen in, in I mean, in the minds and the, in the hearts of, of the learner, but it's kind of through um, uh, writing the, uh, asking the right questions and, and by generating uh, transformative learning experiences that are meaningful for the learner. From information to transformation, is what I heard you say. Yeah, that's great. And Marcus, I know that with Flagstaff College, um, if I understand correctly, you only have one major, sustainability and social change, right. um, which um, very much sounds like what Miriam was getting at, the, the importance of sort of applying knowledge right. Um, right. to addressing the, the major challenges that face us um, in our world. Can you say a little bit about your work and how it fits into this? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, <laughs> so Flagstaff College was going to open last year and then the coronavirus. So we're going to open in the fall of 2021. But the idea of a single major is again back to there's really only one subject matter, and that's life. Um, but there's also this sense that students are actors who want to make the world better. So social change is in the goal of life. I mean, there, there's sort of the goal of personal development, but as people, we're, we're in community. So uh, one way we develop is by developing the communities that we live in. And that, that requires a, a different set of skills. So much of higher education now is about getting a job. And so you pick out an occupation and you say, what do I need to know to do that job? And perfectly rational, <laughs> if, if the economy were rational and, and all that, which it's not. But um, it, it seems like in this time of transformation, what we need to know is what is the world that we live in? What are its needs? What do I have to offer? How can I use my talents and interests interest to make the world a better place? So it, for that kind of orientation, um, you know, people will have different talents, they'll have different interests, they'll, they'll want to change the world in slightly different ways, but we don't need multiple majors to do that. We just need a single major. I know that we're, we're over time and we had started late, but I, I do want to, to wrap up with um, a question about hope, right? So we, we can acknowledge that we live in very challenging uh, and complex times, um, with multiple crises or perhaps one complex crisis. Um, in this time of this just challenging time, what gives you hope for a better future? <laughs> Let me, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, before final remarks, <laughs> uh, I wanted something uh, in relation to my uh, so, so we how to relate the current education, innovative education with a uh, new uh, education to promote ecological civilization perspective. So we coined the new uh, the, the concept the uh, ecological transition education or uh, my word in transformative education for ecological civilization. Yeah. 
So in the name of this kind of, you know, ecological transition education, we are uh, enforcing uh, diverse programs. The, our sole office of education has established new uh, the, the three-year plan, something like that. Uh, for example, we, we are talking about, you know, zero carbon schools. So with the aim of zero carbon schools, the, the school environment will be transformed. And in order that members of education community can grow into ecological citizens, I hope our students become you know, as, you know, ecological citizens. And uh, uh, in order to transform this kind of change, you know, promote this kind of change, you know, we have to do uh, policies on different level, you know, curriculum changing or And the, the 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 retraining teachers' capacity, something like that. And also, you and the, the working on lunches, right? In the classroom culture, changing the classroom culture, something like that. So we are trying to uh, the, the imagine diverse kind of you know, policies from micro level to macro perspective you know in the the micro level for example uh you know we have using this kind of slogan from handkerchiefs to <laughs> carbon zero school facility mm. so we are trying to uh, enforce cyber policies on different levels and recently you know the uh, the globally famous person is the Greta Thunberg, you see. In Korea, you know, uh, following the, her spirit or this kind of new ecological stream, you know, useful climate action, useful climate action uh, was made. The voluntary uh, student with some kind of you know, ecological citizens, you know, sensibility, something like that. So I find hope in this new use or new movement, different from our generations, you know, culture or movement style, the analog style movement, different to the digital movement, something like that. So, uh, we are trying to uh, encourage such a kind of you know, new movement. It's a bottom of movement initiated by the students themselves following the, the global stream. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but if we talk later, I hope to talk some more our achievement of our policy, but maybe it might be very slow. <laughs> I gotta say though, um, what you're doing gives me hope. Um, so thank you for your, for your amazing work. I, I appreciate it. Um, and that goes for all of you. Any final comments or remarks that you wanna make to the people at home? I, I just wanted to answer that question about hope and I was so glad you asked it because, um, you know, it's <laughs> very easy to say <laughs> where, <laughs> What are things that cause you uh, concern and worry and things? That's an easy question. The hope question was harder. And I, when I thought about that, it gave me some real joy. As I, 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 I made a short list. I said John Cobb uh, is some, someone who gives me hope. What a remarkable life he's had and influence and persistence. Um, I, I find the current Pope uh, a, a source of great hope. 
um, and um, kind of a miracle that we have this person at this time. Um, but then I also listed Korea and um, the ECOSIV as um, um, signs of hope. You know, it's the, the kinds of things that are going on in Korea are, as far as I know, going on nowhere else in the world. They're certainly not going on in the United States. Um, so the fact that Korea uh, exists it, uh, is a great source of hope uh, and uh, exists and is doing the good work that they're doing. And then, um, you know, the stuff that Marion is doing and stuff. So this has been a very hopeful experience. I appreciate you putting it together, Andrew. Mm. Thank you. In terms of what, what gives me hope, um, I, I, to build on what, what my, my friends here just said, I think there are many initiatives and examples around the world that uh, are generated by individuals and networks in all regions of the world that are contributing to social transformation. Uh, this gives me hope. Um, I hear we have a network of uh, Earth Charter young leaders and educators from around the world that um, keep sending us information about what they are doing uh, to contribute with the social transformation of their community, and it's amazing. So what give, gives me hope is really to see the possibilities of uh, mm. creativity and adaptation uh, that we have as human, really. Uh, the human creativity and capacity to adapt uh, cannot be underestimated, and this certainly gives me hope. But in terms of education, uh, I want to share what, what's giving me hope is, is that um, every year with my students, uh, we, we look at uh, uh, different education philosophers, right? So from John Dewey to uh, Paulo Freire and many. Mm -hmm. And we, we look at uh, what were their education um, uh, approach, you know, Montessori, Reggio Emilia, etc. And, and all of them have actually a number of key ideas, such as uh, student-centered approach, um, uh, creativity, uh, stimulated human creativity, um, the, the teacher being or the professor being a facilitator rather than taking the role of authority, transformative learning, and etc. And um, uh, they all talk about uh, the importance of uh, interdisciplinary approach to education or transdisciplinary approach to education, project-based learning, and so forth. Uh, but this hasn't really been mainstreaming, right? Um, many of them look at education and, for instance, from Gandhi to Rudolf Steiner, Pestalozzi, they all talked about uh, the importance to bring the, the human as a whole. No? Uh, it's not only about educating the heads and the minds, but also the heart and, and the hands and the human as a whole. Uh, but for, for almost 100 years, 150, 100, or even more years, uh, all these education philosophers have been looked at as uh, alternative education. Yeah. So what gives me hope here is that um, in terms of uh, international policies on education, you know, in terms of what UNESCO has been pushing um, as, as a main drive for education is articulated in the United Nations 2030 uh, agenda. And in there, it's reflected all this kind of new, new paradigm of education, you know, student-centered, participatory, transformative, contextualized, meaningful learning and, and etc. that were embedded in all these education philosophers uh, over the years, no? John Dewey, that were still not really mainstreaming. Now uh, we can see that mm -hmm. as a priority for UNESCO. No, it's, a pri it's an education priority that UNESCO has been articulating and promoting um, with this new uh, 2030 agenda and with the sustainable development goals, because the, there is a specific sustainable development goal, mm -hmm. SDG 4 and 4.7, that articulates a number of these ideas. So my hope, and, and I can almost see that, is that what it's being seen as alternative education that's being proposed by John Dewey and, and Rudolf Steiner and Montessori will eventually become mainstream. 
it's already there, it's already articulated in, in UNESCO and United Nations policy. So now what needs to happen is to, to shrink this gap between international policy and national policy and bring it to the classroom. And I, I have hope that this is actually happening already, this shift to a new paradigm in the way we, we approach uh, learning and education. Thank you very much. I think that closing that gap is already happening. Thanks for the good work that all of you are doing. Um, I appreciate you for taking the time to be here. This has been a, a really great conversation. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground, but it also feels like we're just scratching the surface. So I do hope this is the only the beginning of an ongoing dialogue. Um, the video of today's conversation will be available on Facebook momentarily and will be uploaded to you, the EcoCiv YouTube channel um, mm -hmm. a little later. Um, so feel free to share that with your friends. Um, for more information on events like this, be sure to follow EcoCiv on social media. Uh, we, our next dialogue in this series is actually next week, October 27 at 5 p.m. Pacific time um, on the topic, Transforming Economies for Well-Being sustainable development and ecological civilization. So we have a great panel there. Um, that's gonna be a, a, a wonderful time as well. Thanks again for joining us. Um, this has been wonderful. Be well, everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> See you. <laughs> Thank bye. you.